In less than two years, the Japanese government hopes to welcome some 40 million visitors to the, to the country when Tokyo hosts the Olympics and Paralympics. And it's well on its way to reaching that goal. For five years running, Japan has received a record number of visitors. The spike has brought more people to lesser-traveled areas of the country, and Shikoku is one of them. This week, NHK World is bringing special coverage from Shikoku for an insight into why it's attracting so many and what it has to offer. Hi, I'm Miki Yamamoto. It's day two of our special coverage of Shikoku, and I'm floating through this 400-year-old Japanese garden in Kagawa Prefecture. It is a beautiful day. Today, we're going to focus on the culture and craft work of Shikoku and how people are working to make them thrive in the 21st century. We're also going to explore the spiritual side of things, and for that, Raja Pradhan is at the perfect place. Raja! That's right, Miki. I'm just outside a temple in Tokushima Prefecture on the eastern side of Shikoku. This is the starting point of a pilgrimage people from across the globe come to experience. I'll be back a little later to walk you through it, but for now, here's a taste of what this island of Shikoku has to offer. Japan is in the middle of an unprecedented tourism boom. And that means it's not just cities getting attention. People are realizing Japan has a lot more to offer, much of it off the beaten path, in regions that are known for their natural beauty. One of those places is Shikoku. With an inland sea to one side and the Pacific to the other, it's the smallest of Japan's main islands. And it's big on culture. Much of what you can see today has been around for hundreds of years. Shikoku's famous festivals, traditional arts, and a cultivated spiritual essence. But it's the modern innovation, coupled with an openness to the outside world, that's attracting more and more people to come and discover this place for themselves. NHK Newsline's special broadcast from Shikoku. Okay, we're back in Ditsuring Garden. And here, we want to give you a sense of the region's skilled gardening culture. Now, these grounds used to be owned by a family of powerful samurai lords, the Matsudairas. They developed and expanded the garden over 100 years. And through their employment, gardeners in the region nurtured not only the plants, but also their skills. Today, the park is open to the public, and 700,000 people visit each year. Against the backdrop of a mountain, there are six ponds and 13 hills that are strategically arranged. A major tourist guide lists the park as one of the most recommended places to see in Shikoku. The trees and plants are carefully pruned so they can enjoy their beauty throughout the year. And that takes 14 full-time gardeners working every day. Now, this boat ride allows us to discover the garden from different angles. And the boatmen like Mr. Niwa, who is navigating for us today. Thank you very Hi. much. <laughs> they also have special skills, too. They can take us through the water smoothly with just that pole. In the samurai days, they guided the lords and princes around to enjoy their garden. Well, I'll be back a little later to show you an iconic tree in this garden. It's right across the pond there. But while I make my way over there, let's go to Raja Pradhan in Tokushima. Raja! Thank you, Miki. I've moved into the precincts of Ryozenji Temple in Tokushima. It has a history of more than 1,200 years. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a starting point for pilgrims who make their way across the island of Shikoku. There, back in the hall, is the head monk of Ryozenji. He is preparing for pilgrims to come. And this hall is actually used as an uh, orientation area for pilgrims who are making their, just about to make their journey across Shikoku. 
Today we'll be talking, uh, digging deeper into why this ancient tradition has been preserved for over a millennium and why so many people from around the world uh, choose this place as a destination. But first, here's a look at uh, what exactly this tradition is all about. They come to pray and walk step by step around Shikoku. The pilgrimage is known as Hendo in Japanese. It's a spiritual journey for some, an escape for others, and an opportunity to experience another side of Japan, its people, and a way of life. The 1,200-kilometer route connects 88 temples and can take more than 40 days to complete by foot. The trail retraces the steps of a famous Buddhist priest named Kukai, or Kobo Daishi, who founded a sect of Buddhism in Japan and traveled through the region in the 9th century. Every year, Shikoku attracts more than 150,000 pilgrims from Japan and around the world who follow in his footsteps. I was one of them. Four years ago, I had the opportunity to travel part of the route for a story. Well, I wasn't able to dedicate much of my time during my assignment, but I remember many of the paths were extremely hard to walk, and it must be a big mental challenge for anyone making the whole journey across 88 temples. Joining me today is an expert on the pilgrimage and also the man who guided me back in 2014, David Morton. David is an associate professor at Tokushima University, and he's uh, led research on the pilgrimage for nearly two decades. That's David, right. thank you very much for your Good time. Good to see you again. It looks like you're fully geared up for That's the camera. That's right, I'm already. Yes. Well, let me get back to the wardrobe in just a moment. Um, can I first ask you about your research, where you mm. focus mainly on the history between Westerners and uh, the pilgrims? Right. Um, so what drew you so much to this topic? Pretty well started about 20 years ago when I was reading the blog of an American who came to walk it, and that kind of got me interested. Why would someone come from so far away to come to this long and, and quite difficult journey? And why do you think the Hanro has become this popular for people from around the world? It seems to me people are looking for a place sort of off the beaten track, where it's not so many people, a place where they can slow down. Mm. And again, that's a place that has many uh, long history and culture, and a place where they can interact with the local people. And uh, going back to your outfit now, um, could you explain the significance of some of these items, maybe starting with the robe? Right. So a lot of the pilgrims will be wearing this long white coat, and then along with them, although it's, it's rather new, this one, to mm. wear the white uh, in how, the past. How, how many years? About 60 years. Oh, only 60 years. Yeah. Okay. And you also have the staff. The staff. Okay. So everyone has this. People believe it's Kukai. So you're, he's wa you're walking with him. He's supporting you. And on the staff and on everything you wear is this phrase, Dogyo Ninin, mm. that he is walking with you and helping you along the journey. Okay, so he is together with you. That's right, okay. yes. So let me also get into the spirit of Hendo and get this on. And uh, if I put this on, does that mean that I'll be treated as a Hendo pilgrim? Well, certainly now that wearing something white shows that you've immersed yourself into this wonderful world, um, and then people might come up to you and help you in some way, but it's not compulsory. Um, you're, you're free to make the pilgrimage as you like. Well, so there is that custom of hospitality that you say, that heartwarming tradition, which is very unique to uh, people here in Shikoku, and that's called Osettai. Let's go to a place here in this temple where you can experience that Osettai. Sure, let me show you. Thank you. So for the last 200 years, locals have led the effort in providing food for pilgrims. And even today, people in Tokushima and other prefectures across Japan uh, provide food for people here and serve the pilgrims. All of them lining up here. Hi, arigatouzaimasu. So David gets that osetai of oranges. And what is that slip that you're giving? So in return as a sort of a sign of gratitude, you give them this paper slip. And you put here. Okay, that's maybe some good luck. That's right. Okay, so, okay thank yeah. you very much. I'd like to now bring in uh, Mr. Masaki Yamashita. Uh, he is an uh, official guide of the Henro pilgrimage, and let me ask him in Japanese about what actually the Osetai is. So, 
あの山下さん本日はよろしくお願いいたします。えっ、ー、とお接待の実際きっかけっていうのはどういうなのでしょうか。はい、はい、あの私が歩いて四国回った時に四国の各地の方にお接待をしていただきました。それが非常に励みになってあの無事歩けました。ですからその時の喜びを世界中から訪れる外出て,ていただくお遍路さんにお返ししたいと思って。Yamashita san, ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。So, Mr. Yamashita says that,、uh, you know, he says that when he was on his first tour around the island of Shikoku, he had some tough times where he wanted to just give up sometimes. But he was able to get the hospitality of the people, the Osetai. He felt that, and that really helped him physically and mentally. And now he wants to give something in return to the pilgrims who are on their journey now, and especially to pilgrims from around the world. Now, in about、uh, five minutes, a five minute walk from this temple is a special inn dedicated to Henro pilgrims. And、uh, that's run by a Buddhist nun who's done the trail 138 times. A、uh, young woman from the United States is learning the ropes from her about the Osetai culture. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Hi. Early morning at the inn, a simple breakfast is served. しなくてもいいんだけどやっぱりそのまま出発をさせるというのが私はできないんですねお接待です。Olivia Kivel is a recent grad from the United States.、Mm-hmm. She came here on a fellowship to learn more about お接待。Okay。I came to Shikoku、um, to study the Ohenro and Osetai and、uh, spiritual generosity and、uh, the culture that is hosts and pilgrims、um, and what it means to bring people together. Olivia is learning from Takahara, who serves as a spiritual guide to people who are just beginning their journey. Henro san へのお接待として考えたときには、こういうことがあったら嬉しいかなという自分の遍路経験の中から喜んでもらえるようなことを考えてますね。I went to the Camino de Santiago in Spain in the summer of 2015. I heard about the Shikoku Trail from a fellow pilgrim. The difference、um, in Osetai to me here it feels like it is an entire culture. <laughs> おいでになったわけだから感謝しますよね。はい。でありがとうございました。At first I was like, how does she do this? It is so exhausting, and I'm learning that it just fills your heart. So I think she's showing me how to warm my heart and grow my heart. それを期待してじゃないけれど、優しいのじゃないですか。四国の人たちはそういうのに慣れているっていうかね。So, you can really see that、uh, special bond that's created between the pilgrims and those offering Osetai in a very a unique way here in Shikoku. So, David,、um, you know, you've、uh, met a countless number of people from abroad and you've taken them on that Henro pilgrimage.、Mm. Um, what kind of feedback do you get just before they leave Japan? So, usually I, I interview them and ask them how, how they, they can best describe their journey.、Mm. And so many say amazing and beautiful and life changing and how they've been humbled、uh, along the journey. And it's funny, so many have a sad face.、Mm. They just don't want to go back home. They just love it here. And Shikoku pilgrimage seems to be sort of a magnet and it pulls them back again and again or pulls new people here. And to me, the Shikoku pilgrimage is this wonderful world. Where people from any country, regardless of their faith or the background, can join together on this journey and they're accepted and treated as equals. 
and especially there's that special touch of the Osetai people yes. that makes it unique here in Shikoku. Help one another, yes. Well, thank you very much for all your insight today, David, and we hope that you'll continue to be a gate opener for many more Henro pilgrims to come from abroad. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. And that's all from us here in Tokushima Prefecture at Ryozenji Temple. Uh, before I hand it back to Miki in Kawa Prefecture, here's a quick look at uh, another essence of Shikoku that uh, out of nature. Take a look. Beyond the highest mountain in Shikoku, you'll see it. The Nyodo River. Water that conceals nothing. Deep forests cover most of the river basin. An enormous reservoir to keep the water pure. Torrential rain descends on the mountains, washing away moss and grime. After the rain abates, the river assumes a luminous hue known as Nyodo Blue. Green rocks amplify the color. Blue light from the sun permeates crystal clear water giving birth to the realm of Nyodo Blue. The Nyodo River nurtures life. Above, below, and all around. All right, welcome back to Ritsuring Garden. I'm now on the grounds and I want to show you the most famous tree here, which is that pine tree over there. It's over 200 years old and it originally was a gift from the country's samurai leader to the local lord. And that's a big, big honor. So the gardeners knew there was no way they could let it die. So they planted it here and used the best of their skills to take care of it. And what's really impressive is that when it first arrived here, it was a small bonsai, something like this. Now, bonsai is a Japanese art of cultivating trees in pots to shape nature into artistic forms. Now today, Kagawa Prefecture has become one of the top producers of bonsai in Japan. And we would like to talk more about this with Rika Kawasaki from NHK's Takamatsu Bureau. Welcome to our show, Rika. Hello. Hi. So first tell me, why did bonsai flourish in Kagawa? Well, cultivation started around the time this tree was planted as a side business for farmers. The conditions here are very hospitable. The weather is warm and dry like today, and the soil drains well. The region has abundant pine forests, so Kagawa is especially known for pine bonsai like this one we have here today. Mm, I see. Uh, tell us uh, what aspects do bonsai fans appreciate about them? Uh, generally, there are three things. Uh, first, you can tell how old the tree is by looking at the bark. The more cracks, the older it is. This one is about 150 years old. Wow. <laughs> and second, look at the branches. It's considered beautiful when the branches alternate sides one above the other, like right, left, right, left. Mm -hmm. And third, last is the overall form. Ideal ones like this have strong roots, a thick trunk that tapers towards the top, and branches that twist. Mm, I feel you can appreciate it all the more when you know about those tips. Yes, definitely. I understand that uh, bonsai is gaining worldwide recognition now, is that right? Yes, there are many things that are getting attention online, like this video. In it, this cute little girl thinks about bonsai as she dances around. The video was created by a group of local entrepreneurs and released in multiple languages. 
It's caught some global attention. It's been watched more than 280,000 times and won two awards at an international film festival in Las Vegas last year. Yeah, it's pretty catchy. Yes, and good for marketing. But while demand is increasing overseas, it's the opposite inside Japan. Domestic sales have declined drastically. So, some bonsai growers are now trying to change that. My colleague Midori Taniguchi has the story. Takahito Hanazawa's family has nurtured the bonsai trees in this nursery for over a century. He himself has been caring for trees every day for 40 years. But recently, he's been feeling a sense of crisis. The number of bonsai enthusiasts has declined a lot throughout Japan. Many people tend to see caring for bonsai as costly and as an old man's hobby. But Hanazawa's daughter Michiko is learning. She's trying out new styles to make the trees more relevant to younger generations. We can use any kinds of plants for bonsai. I want to show people that taking care of bonsai is so much fun. So Hanazawa and his daughter have started teaching the art of bonsai to young women, and it's taking root. These university students are members of the Bonsai Girls Project. It was formed at the local university six years ago. We want to highlight the charm of bonsai to young girls. They learn from Hanazawa and now hold workshops to teach locals. The key word is kawaii or cute. The Hanazawas teach them how to make a modern style of bonsai, moss boards. Bonsai planted in soil without a pot and its roots wrapped with moss. I think making moss balls is a good way to hook beginners. The students also use social media to show off their hobby. 8,000 people follow their Instagram. The bonsai girls really enjoy what they're doing, and they can spread information to the world. That's their strength, and it helps us a lot. Hanazawa also trains others to teach like these business owners in the hospitality industry. Daisuke Uchida is one of them. He runs a guest house which welcomes a lot of overseas visitors. It's bonsai. So, so Five from mainland China and Taiwan took part in his workshop. I was really surprised that Japanese people pay attention to the details of bonsai. I want to use bonsai to make people visit our city again. Although bonsai producers have faced difficulties, Hanazawa is finding ways for bonsai to branch out across the world so he can keep his art form alive and well. We need to come up with a good system to bring joy to people who like bonsai for as long as possible. Midori Taniguchi, NHK World, Takamatsu. Now we have moved locations to get a different view of the garden and we are enjoying the sparkling water. Yes, and the breeze is refreshing. It certainly is. Now, Rika, going back to the report, bonsai artists seems to be winning new fans, yes. but is that enough? Not really. Uh, as the current growers get older, the industry needs to find more people to actually take on the bonsai production as a profession. Mm. The city is working on that right now, mm -hmm. though. It's create planning to create facilities to plan, uh, train professionals, and also open bonsai cafes to get more people interested, especially the younger generations. It's a race against time. It certainly is, and we'll have to pin our hopes on yes. the younger generations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Thank Rika you. Kawasaki. 
Now, while Kagawa Prefecture is a place for bonsai, craftspeople in Koji Prefecture make art out of precious coral. That's different from the coral reefs in places we see in Australia. But like with that species, there are also worries over precious coral's future as demand grows from overseas. NHK Koji Bureau's Kento Yako reports. These works are crafted out of a material special to Kochi Prefecture. It's known as precious coral. The vividly colored plants are used for jewelry and artwork and are increasingly popular in Asia, especially Taiwan. Many tourists flock to this market street to splash out on high-priced items. Coral necklace. This is very pretty. But the coral's popularity is threatening the industry and its own existence. The resource could decrease quickly, risking millions of dollars of yearly income for the prefecture. And most of the coral that's harvested is no longer used by craftspeople here. Instead, it's auctioned off to bidders who send it directly overseas at higher prices. It's estimated at more than 70 percent. We're worried about how to preserve the industry for the future. People in Kochi are now trying to tackle both problems. Shunakachi has the only organization in Japan working to grow more coal. He has convinced fishermen to donate live coral branches they happen to catch. Nakachi's organization then grows them in an aquarium and later replants them by attaching them to fishing reefs. Finding the best ways to keep coral alive and to return it to the water, it's all new to us. Meanwhile, Hiro Kawamura's company creates art out of coral. He's taking a new approach to prevent coral from being directly sold off and instead create higher value, intricate pieces out of it first. He's training fresh talent, recruiting young artists who major in sculpture and design. My aim is to create pieces that will stand out and catch the eye. And it's paying off. At the world's largest jewelry fair in Hong Kong, the new pieces were a big hit. This is great! He sold some of the pieces for tens of thousands of dollars. I believe they will continue making more products that can be sold globally. I have high expectations for them. Nakachi too is seeing success, and he presented the results of his experiment to international researchers. We must save this precious natural resource along with our traditional culture. So, from two very different starting points, both men are working for the same goal, sustaining their prefectures, valuable natural legacy. Kento Yako, NHK World, Kochi. Well, yes, sustainability is certainly the key to a future where both business and the environment can coexist. We've seen a lot about craftsmanship today, and we hoped you liked these special programs that we've created for you. That wraps up our special coverage from Shikoku's four prefectures of Ehime, Kochi, Tokushima, and Kagawa. We'll finish off by showing you some more beautiful scenery from the Ritsurin Garden. Thanks for joining us.